Zippity doo da, zippity yay. Today, I'm going to talk about the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Dungeon Master's Guide. Now, this is a long book. I may have to break this up into more than one video, so let's open it up. Now, a lot of people who are used to newer forms of the game say that this is not well organized. I call it stream of consciousness, but if this is the only Dungeon Master's Guide you ever know, it seems perfectly ordinary. Uh, it begins, it's got a table of contents, so you can find stuff. And in the back, um, there's a glossary of terms and an index to help you find stuff. And the things that you look up most often, there's some sheets here that have those on those, but I almost never use these. I would turn to the page in the book because this was my Dungeon Master's Guide and I knew where to find stuff. So, first thing Gygax says, this is in my, this is, is my opinion, this is the best D&D book ever written. And the very first thing he goes into is this book is only for the Dungeon Master. It's not for the players. The players are not supposed to even own a copy of this. And the rules are up to the DM. The DM can change any rule he wants, but I recommend you stick to the rules as best you can so that they're consistent. But if you need to change something, that's okay. So house rules were very common in this era. Uh, he talks a little about different methods of rolling dice and probabilities, but there's four different methods, and method one was the only one I ever saw used. That's roll 4d6, drop the lowest die, and arrange them to taste. Now, there, there used to be a play-by-post group that I was on, and there was somebody who would post old-school games, and he would require a backstory. And my backstories would never meet his requirements. I don't know what it was he wanted. And when I played with new-school players, they wanted this elaborate backstory. They would sometimes have volunteer backstories. And sometimes they ask me for a backstory, and whatever it is I give them is not good enough. Because my I learned with this game, and with this game, he recommends that you start always at first level. That what happens at, in the low levels, especially first level, is very important to how you're going to play your character from then on. If your magic user succeeds by screaming and charging with his dagger and attacking you're going to do that forever. If your fighter screams and charges and attacks and gets badly wounded, you're going to be more cautious in the way you play him. So, in these, when we played this version of the game, there was no backstory. You're, what was important in the character did not begin until first level. But before that was irrelevant. There was this table where you could roll to see what the profession of your character used to be, but it did not offer you any mechanical advantage. That was just for flavor. Sometimes flavor was interesting, like the dwarf who rolled Forester and came up with this story about how he used to be a dwarf raised by elves, and now he's looking for the other dwarves. So after that... There's a table where you can roll, random roll a starting age for your character. And there's a section on diseases. And it explains some of the character abilities and the races. And then it goes into followers for high level characters. Now, when you play this game, usually you're going to retire about this point. You'll make this roll for your followers and you'll set him up and then he'll become an NPC. Most people do not keep playing after they establish a stronghold, but 
for clerics, fighters, and paladins, they would basically get an army. But rangers were different. Rangers would get, since they don't have a stronghold and they wander around, they would get 2d12 followers. And there were bonuses or minuses to your rolls. After you rolled your followers, then you'd roll to see what, what are these followers. And so you'd roll a percent to see are they humans, demi-humans, animals, mounts, creatures, special creatures. If they're humans, they could be a cleric, a druid, fighter, ranger, or magic user. Demi-humans could be any race except half-orc. Animals might be black bears, brown bears, blink dogs, lynxes, giant, uh, giant owls. The mounts could be centaurs, hippogriffs, and pegasus. The creatures could be brownies, pixies, pseudo-dragons, satyrs, and sprites. And the special creatures could include a young copper dragon, a storm giant, a treant, a werebear, and a were-tiger. Now, when you rolled up to see how many you got, you got bonuses or minuses on these rolls. But So if you rolled 21 or higher, you'd be minus 30 on your roll, which when you come to here, that means that you couldn't roll higher than 70, which means no animals, mounts, creatures, or special creatures. You only get humans or demi-humans. And it's the humans that you get, since it can't be higher than 71, it, there are going to be no rangers or magic users for you. And the demi-humans are not going to include any halflings and probably no half-elves either. Now, if you rolled low, if you only got two followers, you'd be plus 25%, which sounds good. That means there's only a 25% chance you get a human. It also means no clerics. And if you look here, it means no dwarves. And no black bears. Probably not a centaur. Uh, less chance of getting a brownie. Uh, no copper dragons or storm giants. Probably not even treant. So the best role for this is seven to nine followers. That's what you want. So that gives you a chance of having the really cool followers. Thieves had a similar table. You would roll 46 to see how many followers you got. And if you rolled too high, you'd be at minus 10%, which means no followers above fifth level. If you rolled too low, you'd be at plus 24%, which means no followers below second level. Um, if your followers were not human, they could be multi-classed. There was also a similar table for assassins for their followers. Now, the assassin class if you hired a non-player character assassin, you could hire them to do spying. But if you were a player character and you were hired to spy, you would roleplay that out, sneaking into the castle and trying to find the papers, things like that. Uh, let's go a bit into the thieves' abilities. It goes, goes into here, it explains them, and one of the big things about this edition is rolling behind the screen that most of these abilities you would roll and tell the player what they get so thief wants to be move silently you say what's your percent and they say 15 percent so you roll and if it's 15 or lower they succeed if it's higher they did not and you don't tell them oh you made your roll they find out when the creature they were trying to sneak past notices them. Now, some of these, like climb walls, you immediately notice you failed your roll, but others you might not. Um, also, these thieves abilities were supposed to be in addition to what a player could do already. So, for example, a fighter might try to be sneaky, and so when they try to be sneaky, you'd roll for surprise to see if he succeeds in surprising who he's sneaking up on. With a thief, 
If you make the move silently roll, that means you've automatically achieved surprise. But if you fail it, then you roll for surprise to see if you surprise them. Now, and our, another example is the assassin. The assassin, in order to use the assassin ability, you have to achieve surprise. So, moving silently, you'd move silently, and if you make the roll, then you've achieved su surprise. If you didn't, then you would have to roll for surprise. Assuming you succeed that, then you could make your roll to see if you assassinate. And so the player would say, I'm going to assassinate by backstabbing him with my short sword. So if you fail the roll to assassinate, you still get to roll to hit as a backstab, which is plus four to hit and does double damage. And if you fail that, if you, if you fail, you hit, if you failed to roll to hit, then you didn't succeed. But um, another thing, um, you know, Hiding. Hiding in shadows is supposed to be like uh, you're going down the corridor, something's coming, so you flatten yourself against the side and hope they don't see you. While a fighter could, for example, hide behind a pillar. And he doesn't need to roll because he's not hiding in the shadows, he's hiding out of sight. The thief can hide out of sight too. Just because you're a thief doesn't mean you can't do stuff that the fighter can do. I just want to make that clear because I've come into conflict with some modern new school dungeon masters over this. There's a list of poisons in here. It's not in the player's handbook. It's because this is something only assassins can buy. There are prices for them and tells what they do. Now it talks a bit about, there's a page devoted to monster as player character. And Gygax says this is a really bad idea that the, the game the game worlds are based on humans being the norm. So if you're a dragon and you come into town, people are going to say, ooh, a dragon, and run away. So, and the, the newer, this version, there were some mechanical advantages to being non-human but they were head level limits and that made it less attractive. But they could be multi-class, which made it more attractive. Before this book, halflings had a mechanical disadvantage. Being a halfling was like an inferior version of fighter. There's no reason you'd want to play a halfling except for role-playing reasons. In some of the modern games, people want to play a particular race because there's some real mechanical advantage to playing that instead of a human. So, you know, it's better to play normal characters, not play monsters. Now there's like a couple of page and a half here on lycanthropy, which I never got to use these rules much because if a player encountered lycanthropy, they would do, at the first opportunity, do cure disease or and make it go away. We didn't ever have a player character werewolf. And it talks a bit about alignment languages. That's something each of these alignments have their own language.